<laughs> We're doing better now. We just got food, so I see. Yes. That was the key, I think, to our evening. Nice uh, shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so hello everyone, how's everyone doing? You just shocked me. Hi. <laughs> shocked me. Shocked. These are like they're they're just small enough, or they're not. They're really not terribly. They're kind of barely useful. <laughs> Put that over there. We're gonna build a better. <laughs> there we go. That's that, that's not precarious at all. That'll last the entire day without issue. <laughs> uh, so hi, welcome to our uh, our panel on the tabletop renaissance, tabletop gaming, and all points in between. So um, just, do, just do some introductions real fast. Sure, you sh you should start. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Matthew Mercer. I am a voice actor from Los Angeles, California, and longtime uh, indoor kid. Uh, yeah, you know what's up. <laughs> yeah, me, me, me and Sunlight didn't get along, still don't get along. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I spent most of my life playing tabletop games, running tabletop games, and am currently the Dungeon Master on Critical Role. <laughs> and Marisha! And now that he said the magical words, Critical Role... <laughs> I can say that I play the half-elven druid, Keyleth, in Critical Role, who... And I am also a voice actor, uh, slash person who does things in the entertainment industry um, out of Los Angeles. I am uh, Margaret in the Persona franchise. I'm Laura Arsade in Legends of Heroes, Trails of Cold Steel, the longest name in history ever. Um, I'm in Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain. And and a uh, battlefront and and he's my dungeon master. <laughs> yeah. And he was actually my first dungeon master. And then uh, and then I I know I know. And then I went on and I had many other dungeon masters. And then I came back. <laughs> this is a good panel for context. Yeah. Any other panel, this would be a very different mood right now. <laughs> That's next door. Yeah, so there you go. That's the 18 plus at 11. Um, oh, I thought she was like talking about like the vape show. Like, no vaping. No, no vaping. <laughs> I keep seeing those signs everywhere, and I'm I, like, as a person who in no way should perform has ever nor would vape, I it still, still feel, feel like, like you're in trouble. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, well, I didn't, I'm not. Why? Yeah. Like, oh, I was. I it's silently aggressive. It's like when a cop it, like, gets behind you when you're driving, and you're just like, I'm just gonna, 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 gonna mess with my, my radio. I'm just gonna, just gonna act natural. Yeah. Just gonna, I don't have any reason to be yeah. concerned. My registration's that, good. And my registration's good. Work. Why yeah. am I still nervous? Ten and two. Ten and two. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. So this is a uh, th this panel is to discuss. Talk. It's generally going to be a Q&A here, talking about all nerdy points of uh, tabletop gaming, board gaming, uh, role-playing games, and all the, those fun little adventures and experiences many of us have had in our lives or are currently discovering, and or will hopefully discover very soon. Um, so yeah, for those who aren't aware, uh, Critical Role is the show that we do uh, every Thursday, mostly every Thursday, on Geek and Sundry's Twitch stream, where us and a bunch of other voice actors play Dungeons and Dragons and roll dice and have no idea what we're doing. We is... have an insane cast of people like Laura Bailey, <laughs> Travis Willingham, <laughs> and Liam O'Brien, <laughs> and, uh, and Dallison, and Ashley, <laughs> and Sam yeah. Regal. I'm just gonna let you guys know right now, we we turned down playing D&D with Sloth today to be here with you guys. That's true. That's how much we love you. <laughs> friends are just sending pictures of him. <laughs> right. They're like, look what you're missing, guys. And I'm like, well, I'm in Pittsburgh. Yeah. I, got, I got the email. I've got Permani brothers. Take yeah. Yeah. That's 
see you later. <laughs> I, I got the email a couple weeks ago, like, hey, would you like to Dungeon Master for a sloth? I'm like, yes. Okay. When is it? Friday. Oh. Can I just say? Ivan's got this. Ivan's got this. Can I just say the most ridiculous conversations were ever had, though, in the Geek and Sundry offices, re like revolving around this sloth. I kept. I was like, guys, you, we have to stop talking about him like he's a real person. <laughs> Even stuff like, cause it all started with them. Like, we were like, well, when's the sloth gonna come in? And they were like, well, you know, we got a call. We got to see uh, what his schedule is and see when he's available, cause we're gonna have to book him out. And I'm like, and they're like, you know, he's like two weeks out. And I was like, what the. I'm not like I'm available next week. I'm pretty sure the sloth works more than I do in the entertainment industry. I place the blame squarely on Zootopia and Kirsten Bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kirsten Bell, yeah. yeah. But yeah, and then, and then Ivan was like, yeah. So the uh, the sloth is actually going to be playing a um, a um, like a half elven monk or something like that. And I'm like, what? Stop saying these sentences. Like it's like it's gonna happen. It's weird. It's a wonderful time to be alive. It's great. It's great. <laughs> this it's is what awesome. Kurzweil singularity was referring to. <laughs> the, the slot singularity. Uh, anyway, we got a little off topic Back to there. That, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we played D and D, uh, and I I grew up playing all sorts of RPGs, everything from GURPS to Savage Worlds to Rifts, and most of the Palladium stuff was broken as it was. It's wonderful and broken as it was. Oh, exactly. <laughs> In a, in, a, in a very fever dream kind of way, uh, Wormwood's enough to say, you know, what's going on there. But yeah, uh, so I've, I've always found tabletop role-playing games, not only for me, were a great place to explore narrative and, and just be more comfortable as a person. I think a lot, of, a lot of my social skills as a developing young adult, I developed through practice in role-playing game environments. As a performer, as a dungeon master or, or game master, it was such a great playground for me to kind of learn about what I could do and, and, and expand my repertoire and range and uh, it, it's just I, I owe a lot of my current life to tabletop games if not most of it I think one of the main times we ever hung out was when I was asked to run a game of D&D for you so even you're part of that thanks I give tabletop gaming no too cute but uh but yeah so that, that, that's kind of my tabletop background there Marisha you got started uh, well, you you were my first dungeon right. master. I mean, I, I grew up in Kentucky, so um, it's not that my parents were trying to keep D&D &D away from me or anything like that. My parents just also didn't really have access to it, and we didn't have access to it because, you know, it was it's Kentucky. And, uh, you know, it's... It's the devil! Yes, yeah, the devil is you know, worshipping that, that cult shit. And uh, so I was like, no... Um, so then we came, I came out to, but you know, I, I grew up with uh, Magic the Gathering and I played a lot of RPGs and you know, a big Final Fantasy nerd and so I was, I was always a, a video game and comic book nerd beforehand, just didn't have the resources to play any tabletop games and then came out to Los Angeles and was like, hey Matt Mercer, are you run a D&D? &D? And I thought you'd, you'd say no. And then he, he said yes. <laughs> Ran it for you and your boyfriend at the time. That's true. <laughs> That's true. So watch out for the Dungeon Masters out there. <laughs> and for all those aspiring Dungeon Masters, <laughs> it works. <laughs> it works. That helps to be proficient in persuasion. No, uh... <laughs> No, it was like a year and a half later. You guys were already broken up. Yeah, so it, was, it, was, it, yeah, wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what, what's been really cool is, you know, and, and I'm I'm not one of the OG role playing game. There, there's a, a, a generation of role playing game people that were there from the beginning, the old Gygax days, the chainmail pre D and D days. You know, where it was began in, in strategic, you know, war miniature combat, and then built onto the role playing from there. And, uh, and I've learned so much from people who came from that genre, and uh, it's been really cool to watch through our show all these different generations of, of the old guard, and like you had the 80s kind of revamp when, they, when GURPS got big, and they had this kind of resurgence in role-playing games in the 90s during that Rob Liefeld era where Palladium got really popular. And, uh, and even then it was still a very, very subgenre of entertainment and socially had this stigma that had partially stemmed from a lot of the, the early anti-D&D, &D, you know, demon magic stuff that happened, and also this kind of idea that only kids who had 
no social skills and you know didn't want to to play with other people that was kind of the idea and it was never that i never had that experience yeah in fact it's like that's kind of like the total exact opposite actually how did that even happen? How did D&D players get that reputation? Uh, that, largely because of media and because... Uh, and and, and Tom Hanks and well, faces also, and monsters. monsters. But, but also, to be fair, and, then, and I don't want to go into this too because this is a whole different discussion, but a lot of the, the American identity of masculinity stems from this very go sports, go, you know, prove... And, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can do both. But there was this idea that if you weren't the outdoor, you know, varsity sports kid, um, and you preferred to sit down and make up fantasy worlds that that was considered the unmasculine thing and, and the not, you know, desirable thing. And, of course, media pushing this whole, you know, pro protect your geek feel in the, uh, you know, the 70s and 80s especially. Um, it all just kind of... Bang Theory laugh tracks, you know. <laughs> Sorry if you're not a fan. Of, if you're a fan of the show, I, I'm I, sorry. No, I'm not. I, I, there's no remorse. It is not for me that show. Um, power to you. Not for me. Uh, but but you know, there's this this trend that led to this unfortunate stigma that that the the genre of gaming took on for a long time, and we're finally pulling out of that. And I think a lot of that mainly is, thanks to Travis Willingham. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's definitely helped in that regard. Yeah. Um, the guy who played football in college. Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel. Yeah, Vin Diesel. Um, Vin yeah. Diesel was one of the, yeah. the breaking points, too. And I think and it's, it's, it's a combination of, one, pop culture has become culture now. Um, so with all these major geek properties that everyone all of a sudden is stopping and realizing, hey, well, so we all like Spider-Man in this room? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Bro. Bro. It's cool, yeah. You know? We have, we've had that wave now with geek culture, which has been really cool, and now we have this new wave of storytellers, all the people that are becoming the producers and writers and actors that are inheriting the entertainment industry are all the kids that grew up in the 70s and Surprise, 80s and 90s. Surprise, they're nerds. Yeah, <laughs> playing Surprise. these games. And so now you look at the people that are, that are creating all the mainstream media entertainment, and they're all of us. They're all the indoor kids. So instead of going out and you know beating up kids for their lunch money, they were inside figuring out orc encounters in the second level, level of the dungeon. <laughs> now they get to get paid for that. <laughs> um, so, so we're at this, this, this kind of renaissance period where, one, it's becoming okay to talk about it and, and openly be proud of the fact that you're you know, a, a tabletop role-playing geek. And two, people who have always been interested now have an open forum where they can actually be, you know what? I've always wanted to see what this is about and try it. Can we do that? And there not be this kind of negative backlash. And it's it's been really, really cool to watch so many people come into this genre of gaming. Uh, run now. <laughs> 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 um, they went to go bathe. We're all safe now. Anti-life shell. Be within 10 feet of me, guys. All over him. Fit everyone within 10 feet of you. Everyone within 10 feet and we're good. The, the best Katamari Damacy level ever. Uh, <laughs> by the way, guys, I want to point out this gentleman over here uh, who... If those who saw the um, the episode of Christmas, who gave me my Thordak, my my colossal red dragon right there. That's right. Applaud him. Now get up. Get out. No, 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 then. I'd also like to point out the amazing woman up front cross-stitching the Dorolo crest. Because <laughs> that caught my eye. Can we, can, is, I know it's a work in progress. Is it okay if we see? Like, what the what? The what? what the what? This is insane! You can tell Sam this is cross-stitching. <laughs> oh my god. Look at this thing go! Oh my god, you guys! You guys! And this is actually, and I'll, I'll segue from my conversation, I'll come back to it. But I also want to point out, one of the wonderful things about this community that has blown me away is how many people have got into the game and created their own adventures and share them with us on a weekly basis, and other people who have taken inspiration from this silly little D&D show we do 
and do incredible crafts like this and do incredible artwork and write their own stories and, and make their own little minis and, 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 and paint them and send us pictures. Just like the amount of, of creative inspiration that's, that's come out of this community is, it's amazing. That's a valid, very valid example of it. Yeah, well yeah, no, it, it's, it's in, so incredibly, uh, it, or just heartwarming to see the whole art, inspiring art aspect and that's that's what I think is incredible about it and, and like I said with like critical role would not be the show that like we wouldn't be critical role if it wasn't for the critters and the fan art and the fan fiction and the music like every every little piece of art that uh, that you guys put out we try and catch on we try and catch every single one of them and, and it's just all incredible it's Liam's Liam's obsession it is Liam's <laughs> obsession he scours the internet and he collect. knows almost all the artists he knows all of you you people by name I'm not joking. I'm not joking. He Test him like on it. Tell the, him we said that. All the <laughs> and if he doesn't know it, he's disappointed you. <laughs> not not actually. Liam Appreciation Day. Yeah, it was Liam Appreciation Day. Show him your appreciation <laughs> by asking, what's my name? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, to, to finish my point from earlier, what's, what, what's really cool about this, this emerging period of time is, is you have... Uh, old guard and new guard coming together and discovering each other and you're starting to find that there is no real difference in age and background. When we had a few critters come by the studio one time and it was their gaming group and the gaming group was a 21 year old blonde pop star, a 48 year old uh, gray haired blacksmith, we had like a, a mid 30s uh, accountant lady and it was just like every single a, you couldn't pick a stranger, eclectic group of individuals from different walks of life that were sitting there and geeking out so hardcore about their last adventure they had together. And I'm like, this, this is the magic of tabletop gaming. Because when you're all at that table, none, none of your background and your, 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 you know, where you came from matters. You're all there creating this experience together and you will remember it as vividly as any other experience you've had in your life. Well, and, uh, uh, there was an amazing woman who wrote us uh, I think over our Facebook page not that long ago and was saying how she was thinking us um, that she was like I'm a 39 year old mom who you you guys convinced me um, that it was okay for someone of my age to play and to pick up and she picked up a book and started playing a game and and that's what I think is the most important lesson that we can learn out of just tabletop gaming in general is that there's this really sad kind of societal pressure that kind of starts it, it pushes on you really hard when you are suddenly a child and then you're suddenly an adult and then when you're suddenly an adult it's like you're not allowed to play anymore and you're not allowed to use your imagination and I think that's a really sad just travesty and uh, I think it's important to remember that adults can still play pretend and make believe, and that that's really important to our mental health. Yeah. And as, especially as, as stressful as life is as an adult. Yeah, it's so, something yeah. you can, it's that you should. Yeah. It's it's healthy. It's therapeutic. It you learn about yourself through play, you know, and it's and you engage in relationships and build relationships a lot stronger than you would elsewhere. It's it's. It's a wonderful medium, and just one of many mediums, uh, tabletop gaming, one of many mediums that allow you to reconnect with that sense of, of play as an adult through all ages. And it's been really cool to watch that kind of uh, come to the forefront of, of society again. It makes me really happy. Yeah, I, I've been saying this a lot here lately, where I've kind of slowly started to realize, uh, especially with the show Making Our Games Weekly, uh, that Keyleth has kind of totally infiltrated me a little bit. And she's made me a better person. And I legitimately believe that a hundred percent because it she's I'm I'm not like Keyleth. There's so many ways that she's different from me, but being her for so long has taught me to empathize with people who are like her and she's she's influenced me and she's I think she's made me a more empathetic person. Um and, and I think that's a lot of important things that you can get from role playing games that people don't talk about that we should yeah well it's, it's a new form of story oh I, I have a very similar experience where since we've started playing weekly I've become more schizophrenic <laughs> <laughs> talk to myself more when nobody's home no but like it's it's storytelling as a medium is as old as we've had people you know the the idea of, of telling stories and creating mythology and 
the elders of the of the tribe telling the younger generation about the great heroes of old, whether they be historical or created. And it's these tales, these heroic tales that inspire the next generation to want to be better people, to become these heroes, to try and make their mark on the world uh, for the better. And this is, you know, this is a medium for all of us where we can create something, an aspect of ourselves that we don't get to explore and experience often enough. And through these, these games, create a character and a personality that even in the smallest way, will help us be a better person. Unless you're playing a totally like shitty group of evil characters, in which case it's just to blow off some steam and that's totally cool. <laughs> Don't let that affect it too much. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 really, it's a really cool therapeutic medium in that way as well. Yeah, it just te it teaches you to think differently and to think how other people might think and, and realize that it, it breaks down the idea of the monomyth that there's like a definitive line between good and evil, which I've never believed. Um, you know, even, even bad characters, even the evil of, of characters, generally have motives that are rooted pretty logically. So, and I, and I think it's important to just kind of, yeah, they're, they're good lessons. Yeah. 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 We should, we should take questions because we've been say. Like rambling. Sorry, just talking at you. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and start, uh, we'll start calling folks for questions here. Uh, like, we'll go ahead and start with this wonderful lady over here in the green dress. Uh, so, I'll just That's all right. I, I tried to run a game once, and I was awful at it, because I'm very much, okay, I planned all this stuff out, and of course nobody does that. I, We're all awful at the know, beginning for that reason, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> so, like, what, what are things that you do to prepare, or just kind of prep for it, or exercises, or like, Improv classes, like what? What helps you to improv that? It's funny you say improv classes. Uh, it's not a route for everybody, but it is tremendous, tremendously helpful in so many aspects of life, in my opinion. Taking improv classes, not just as an actor as a performer, but just as a person, it teaches you, one, how to work really well in a group. It teaches you a group dynamic and energy where it's all collaborative. It when also it's... teaches fast response time. Yes. Very, very, very quick thinking, uh, thinking on your feet when you're handed stuff you weren't expecting. It, 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 Doctors it, will take improv classes to help with their response time. True story. So it helps tremendously in many social aspects, but one of the largest rules of improv is yes and, which is you do not deny another person's suggestion. You accept it, justify it, and then add your own aspect to it. And that, that whole mentality is such a great way to look at most of your social aspects in life, you know, where you can take somebody else's idea, whether or not you agree with it, you know, in, in a group setting, you can take what they have and then add something to it to try and bring it closer to where you wanted it to be. And it's, it's, a, it's a more positive loop than, than a negative one. Um, and, and the reason why they do that, the reason why that rule is there is because as soon as someone denies you something, it does two things. One, it makes the person who is setting up you know, their point, look like an asshole, you immediately just rip the rug out from under them. Two, it stops the scene. You know, so say for example, if I was like, hey Matt, it's in the ski slope totally awesome today? No, we're not in a ski slope, we're in a store, what are you talking about? Now I look like a fucking asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and then like, I can't, you can't go anywhere from that. You're, that's it, done. But if I'm like, man, this ski slope totally crushing some snow. I don't ski. <laughs> I don't know. Like, what are yeah, you saying? But the snow's getting kind of slick. It's almost turning like it's ice. Wait, this is an ice volcano. <laughs> what? Oh my god, I didn't know you didn't tell me we were going to the ice volcano, bro. Happy birthday. <laughs> you, know. you know, and see how that just... And, and when you accept it, and you're just like, ice volcano? Totally. It, it gives you permission to keep going. And it builds on it. And I, and I think that's very important. And in fact, one of the people ask me all the time, um, what was your worst DM experience? And I was playing a Buffy the Vampire Slayer tabletop RPG, and I was a pyromancer. And um, I was used to him being like, how do you want to do this? So I got a kill. So I thought in my head, I heard Matt going, how do you want to do this? But it was a different DM. And um, so I was like, all right, so what happens is my character, she concentrates, and then I take like a little fireball and kind of starts ha like hovering over my head, and then it arcs across the room, and it just poof, and it lights the vampire on fire, and they die in a blazing flame of glory. And the DM, swear to God, goes, uh, yeah, you know, pyromancy doesn't really work that way. And I was like, 
Well, that's, that's funny you mention that, because pyromancy doesn't exist. <laughs> it's not like a real thing, or we're playing pretend, or does it matter? Does it really ultimately matter? Yeah, it's already dying. It's already dead, yeah. Does it matter how I kill it? You're actually, pyromancy is just actually to walk up to the vampire and light it on fire with your lighter. Yeah. It's, <laughs> well, no, it's more of a skill was, trade. His, his response was, uh, the way pyromancy actually works, it's more that you just like meditate really hard, and then whatever you're meditating on just bursts in the flame. And I'm like, mm, that's so cinematic. <laughs> So cool, I'm just gonna... Or not, not, or so different from what you suggested? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, so it's just stuff like that, that, that giving people permission to keep going. The, that positive loop, like yeah. the positive feedback loop. Mind you, if it doesn't change the, you know, if, if she wasn't a pyromancer and did that, the DM might be like, well, you don't really have any fire powers, that's a little weird. <laughs> that, then, yeah, there's a line. But yeah, if I it, thought it was like just a vampire slayer and didn't have magical abilities, then that, that'd be one thing, but... But yeah, you know, if, if, the, if, if it's not going to change the way the game plays, and it, it's, it's cool cinematically, and it makes the player smile as they describe it, there's no harm in letting you know, most aspects of that suggestion go through. You can even tweak it a little and tone it down as a reversal, but still maintain the core of it, and they still have as much fun. Um, to get back to your question, outside of improv, though, um, it helps... Uh, who knows what's going to happen in the game anyway, but you want to be comfortable going into it. So, best you can, try and think of a number of alternate possible routes. You don't have to flesh them out dramatically, but even have, like, a few little bullet points of, like, well, if they go to the left, they might find a you know a hive of ropers, you know, or if they end up going to the to the the right hand side of of, of this cavern structure, there's a long uh, crevasse that leads down into a small society of fungus men, and that's enough of a note that might never happen. But if they end up going to the right, you at least have some idea of where they're going. It also helps to have like a little rolodex or a collection of note cards with just random NPCs that if you have free time. Just create random characters. They don't necessarily fit in your world, but if someone all of a sudden decides, I want to go ahead and see who lives in that far house you mentioned three sessions ago on the outskirts of the farmland, you're like, uh. Or if Percy's like, uh, where can I go to buy black powder? <laughs> Another very valid example. So, or if, uh, who was it, Laura Bailey is like, uh, where can we go to find a map? I need a map maker. Aww. Too soon. Shh, no spoilers. <laughs> By the way, guys, this is, this is a no spoiler zone for the record. Best we can. We can talk about loose things, but especially from like the show that last Thursday or past couple weeks, try and be careful not to spoil anything for those who are completely caught up because it is a lot to catch up on for some people. Five episodes left. All right, you're getting there. You're getting there. Um, but yeah, so I mean, loosely preparing where you can, um, but I cannot stress enough, no matter how much you prepare, you will always be caught off guard, and that's what makes it fun as a GM. You kind of have to embrace that chaos and just see where it takes you. So you know, spend some time throwing a couple things in the world that could be tools in your toolbox if that situation arises so you're not completely left out in the void. But through those experiences, you'll eventually become more comfortable just seeing where it takes you when you have no idea what's happening. <laughs> Next question. You pick. Uh, your hand went up pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. I guess we're doing the stabbing thing. Sure. Uh, for it. Yeah. Great. Um, in my experience, having couples in a game generally puts an expiration date on that game. Nothing will stop a game faster. Breaking up with you. What was your question? <laughs> your game is like 50% couple at this point, unless I really misunderstood the question and answer. Uh, no, that's true. No, we're, we're there, uh, Lauren, Lauren, Travis, Travis uh, Liam, and Sam. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So do you have uh, any... Does it, how does it change a session to have people together in real life who aren't necessarily together in the game? And then there's role-playing that goes that way? Because I've only had bad experience. Right. It can, That's a great question. Levels. It depends it depends on the people you're playing with. And real quick, for those of you in the back who might have heard a question, he said, uh, how do you deal with couples in games? Because that tends to put an expiration date either on the game or the couple. <laughs> um, yeah, or continue. Or both. Or yeah, both. yeah you, uh, first, you always have to gauge the players who are involved. Um, if, if there is a concern uh, of player characters forming romances, there being any sort of role play, you know, like in our game, we have Marisha's character, Keyleth, and Liam's character have a, a 
like this kind of Ross Rachel romance that's been going for a while now. Um, but we're also performers, and we're all friends beforehand, and we're mature. And Liam, even before he even began to pursue this, came up to me as the DM and was like, "I'm feeling Vax might be building these feelings towards Keyleth, but I don't want to pursue that for the story if it's weird at all." Or so I'm like, "No, no, no that's fine," because I knew he's a performer. We know that separation between character and self. However, not everyone can be as mature or as trained to be able to keep that separation, and some people might be more jealous than others, and I have seen people who have been couples that game together and it's caused strain. So one, you have to gauge the players and the atmosphere of who you're playing with, and if you don't think or have any question that the atmosphere could facilitate that, then just don't do it. It's not a necessary aspect of it, um, or at least minimize it to the point where it isn't like this dramatic moonlit sequences where they're both staring at each other's eyes and you have to sit there and watch your you know, wife bear her soul to the guy who every now and looks over at you and kind of gives you like a eyebrow raise. <laughs> Sending you texts, I'm coming for her, dude. You know, like, that'll, that'll be a problem. So you, you, have to get, you have to gauge the maturity level, and if there is a concern, then, then don't, don't invite it, because it'll just, it gets, it gets messy. Um, after you've played with them for a while, and you know the dynamic between you as friends and in the game, and you feel it can be something that can be done, by all means. But if it's kind of a newer gaming group or people you aren't, you know, don't have long-term fr friendship with and can really get a beat on how they play with that, you gotta be a little careful. As far as like DMing her, uh, she does not put me on the couch when, I, when bad things happen to Keyleth, like the internet seems to, to suggest. Every episode, it doesn't matter. You might, you could like do something amazing and be like, oh, Matt's getting on the couch tonight. And I'm like, sure. It's a comfy couch, I mean. It's, it's a nice couch, yeah, you'd be fine. Yeah, so... Uh, no, there, there's a separation. We're, we're not insane enough yet <laughs> to where we don't recognize the separation. Um, I'd be lying if I said we didn't absolutely get 100% emotional um, about our characters and about things that happen in the game. Um, but I think those two things aren't mutually exclusive. You can get emotional and you can have feelings without you know, and still realize that it's still just a game and this is still just pretend. Um, still doesn't mean that this game for us hasn't been incredibly important and even though it is just pretend, it's not, you know, like we, it's beyond, it's so much more at this point, it's hard to quantify, um, but yeah. yeah. Boys, if you're playing in a game and your girlfriend's the dungeon master and your character dies, it's not her fault. That's how the game goes. Ladies, if you're the dungeon master and you kill off your boyfriend's character, don't do it just because you can. <laughs> that goes for both roles, but the idea is just to respect the fact that death happens in the game, difficult circumstances happen, and uh, unless you really did something to piss them off the week beforehand and you think this is getting back at you, in which case you probably deserve it and just keep your mouth shut anyway. <laughs> um, you know, just understand it does happen, don't take it personally. Next question. Yeah. Let's go. You pick. Let's go. Let's go in the back. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, you also have the purple shirt rolled up to your elbows. Yes. In-game assault? Assault. Anger. Oh, salt. I was like, bitter. what is happening at your games? Is it a fight club you're running? Jeez. In-game salt. <laughs> <laughs> Roll save versus pillar. Yeah. It does happen. It does happen, yeah. Totally. It's a valid question. So those of you here, just how do you manage a game uh, for, might have many different types of people from, from different, uh, you know, who want different things out of the game that can cause conflict and sometimes, you know, strife within the gaming group, both in character and outside. 
Um, one, I would be very clear with all the players before you even start playing what kind of game you want to run and what everyone wants out of it. It's very hard to run a game that'll appease all the hardcore role player theater geeks and all the number crunching uh, min maxer, you know, Diablo style kill shit take loot gamers. You can find a happy medium, but you have to make sure that everyone's on board for that happy medium before you get too deep into the game. Otherwise, you're going to have the party trying to pull totally different things out and frustrated when none of them are getting exactly what they want. So you want to make sure that everyone understands what you're shooting for, and then everyone in the party expresses what they kind of want for their own fun. Because even though it's your game as the dungeon master, you know everyone brings something to that table, and you have to make sure that part of your job as dungeon master make sure that everyone's still having a good time. Um, two, not all gamers were gel. There are plenty of people that that I had a good time playing with, but I know that these gamers would do terrible in a group together. You know, I've run different sessions that have been fun. But I know that I couldn't cross those parties. They, were, they would tear each other apart. So that just comes from experience and, and reading it based on those discussions. Um, also, if any of these issues start arising during the game, talk to them outside of the game. You know, after the session ends, if you felt any of that weirdness, shoot an email off, or make a phone call to them individually, and be like, "Hey, I felt some there's some strange stuff going on here. Do you have any concerns? Or anything you want to talk about?" And just hear them out. Don't combat it. Don't try and shut them down. Just like you know, any personal interaction, listen to what their feelings are, whether or not you agree with that. Let them get it out, and then from there, try and explain as to what you're trying to accomplish with the game, and ask the question, is this the kind of game for you? If the person can go ahead and, and work towards that collaborative storytelling experience and uh, try and compromise for the, for the sake of the entire story in the group what it is they're selfishly wanting versus what the whole group wants, then you'll be fine. If not, maybe they need to find another group that suits their needs as a gamer. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I played many games with people that I we don't blend as gamers, but I wish them well on the stuff they do and I you know, I don't hold anything against them for that. And just kind of going off of this as a player and talking to everyone else out there who are players, um, there is be kind to your DM. Not only because he can kill you at any moment, but <laughs> respect your DM and respect um, the time that has been put into these games, because that's, you know, and not necessarily this is what you were saying, um, but you will sometimes have a, one of those players that gets in and you just kind of is that like bull in a china shop type of mentality and just kind of wants to, to take over a little bit and, you know... And there's nothing wrong, and to Dungeon Masters, there's nothing wrong uh, with being like, hey, that's not cool, because do understand, players, that your DM is put in probably at least an hour, if not more, for each hour you play of game time. So there's already probably been ten hours of prep before you even showed up to the game. So there, it, you're all there for fun, and it's a blast, and it's awesome, but there is... A, there's a line, you guys know what I'm talking about, where there's a line of, of being respectful and having fun and, and, and joining in as a group, as opposed to kind of mocking it and... Trying to get a rise out of the other players or well, the DM. Right, or, or you know, trying to hijack the whole game, which is disrespectful not only to your dungeon master, but to everyone else who set aside time to be there. Um, you know, in D&D, &D, it's, it's co-op. You're working to build a story together, and that's... If you can do that and find a group of good chemistry that can do that, that's when you'll be the most magical of moments. And if a person isn't working out, especially if you're the one who's running the game, you invited them to be part of your story and your gaming experience. If you don't think it's going to work, you have every right to not invite them back. And if you explain to them why, and in a very rational and very respectful way, and they still can't handle it, then that's just even more of a clarification as to why this probably shouldn't continue with them as part of the story. Most times, in my experience, people will be will be more understanding, and a lot of times they're just not aware of it. And once that discussion happens, like, oh, I didn't realize I was acting that way, or like, oh, I see what you're going with. Okay, I, now that I'm aware... I'll try not to act that way anymore. You know, it's. I'm a firm believer that 90% of the world's problems are based on misunderstandings, and through communication, we can solve 90% of the world's problems. Um, doesn't mean we will, but we can. I, I believe that's the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? We're not trying to be a fun police. There's a difference here, right? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Your fun is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> We're not it. trying to do that. But yeah. Uh, next question. You pick. Okay. You had your hand up. Yeah. Ties into that last question because you 
guys can have that with Tiberius leaving. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's been said that it's a, it was a very amiable thing. You guys are all still friends and everything. Is there any chance that he, maybe not come back to you permanently, but would come back and do like, you know, hey, pop in and do a one-shot type thing with you or come in and guest star for one episode? <sighs> I will say we have nothing but the utmost respect and appreciation for everything that, that Orion brought to the show and the care of Tiberius and the time that we did play together. Um, however, some circumstances in life come to a point where they have to go their separate ways, and he has his paths to walk, we have our path to walk, and we wish him well, and we've supported him uh, through that entire endeavor. Um, what the future holds, I can't say. You know, circumstances change, people change, uh, it's, I can't tell the future, and I, I like to think the best of most people, um, in all circumstances, so I, I can't give an answer one way or the other. Um, but uh, but whatever, whatever he's up to and whatever's uh, you know whatever the future holds, I wish him the best of luck, and uh, we shall see. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, let's, yeah, you're the plaid. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of plaid suddenly in the audience. <laughs> This is a great question. It's a great question because when it comes to to especially homebrewing your own content and as a new DM, there is nothing more frightening and daunting than going, "Okay, I'm going to build a world." Where do I start? <laughs> um, and really, the biggest just like it was keep it small. You don't you're not building a world. You're building a town. You build. You figure out a couple shops build maybe like a couple dozen NPCs, even less if you want to for your first session. Come up with a couple of factions, like a merchant's guild, or maybe like a sailor's guild, maybe there's a little underground you know, thieving ring or a fence that's running a, a darker circuit in the town. And you just really flesh out this one little town, and you can build two or three adventures that work just in this town. And then once you play a game with your players in that town, what they do, the actions they take, will inspire you to think of other ways that you can expand the world from there. And that, that town will give, give you, you know, as many sessions as you want to, depending on how much further you want to go into the rabbit hole of what this town has. There could be a whole ruin beneath the town that opens up a whole subterranean portion of the campaign, and they've still only really been in this one town. And you could run 10, 12, 15 more sessions just in this one little area. But the inspiration of playing in that one little town will help you build the world. It'll give you ideas in between. And then you expand to one of the neighboring towns or one of the neighboring uh, deserts, which has what used to be a town that is now com almost completely buried by sand and the elements are destroyed, but there's now a, you know, a, a tribal society of rather unscrupulous individuals that are now attacking caravans from the first town. Now you can flesh out where that is. Maybe there's a small society there where they're actually not that bad. They're just trying to survive, but they're being kept at bay by these subterranean desert creatures that are now starting to rise up and fight them, and there's now all three sessions you could do with this other secondary desert civilization. You've done 15, 20 sessions with two towns. So you don't have to create, I don't know where any of that came from, by the way, you're welcome to use it. Uh, but, uh, but you know, the, those are just two locations where you can run many, many sessions, and that's building your own homebrew world, but you didn't have to create the world. It's very daunting to do that. When I began running their game, I created Stillbed, and that was for the first two sessions. And then I created Western, and that was for the next six sessions. And these are like eight-hour lab, you know, big sessions, and we can only play once every four to six weeks. You know, I didn't have Tal'Dorei figured out until they were getting towards the end of Western's arc, towards the winters, the first Winter's Crest Festival, and I was like, well, we, I just started developing the clasp, and there's a part of the clasp here in Westward, but there's got to be a major center for the clasp, and there has to be a major center to this continent they're on, and I began to develop Iman, and that was kind of leading up to the Winter's Crest Festival. When they finished up with that, then I could lead them towards Iman, and then I began to flesh out Iman the more they expressed it. And it's very much like trying to catch up to the train, you know, while being on the tracks. You're just, you're, you're okay, okay, then, then, uh, what's happening next week? Next week, uh, I get the feeling they might want to go ahead and check out this, uh, this, this 
petting zoo. Sure, let's get flesh out of the petting zoo. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. No, there's still so many times where I'm like, how did you know we were gonna do that? You had like some inkling that we were gonna do that. And I don't know why we just, like someone was just like, well, said something in passing. And you're like, no, we're gonna do that. Here's the key. I have six inklings of what you're gonna do and I try and prep some of all six. So when you choose one of them, I go, I totally had that figured out. <laughs> or when you pick one of the, that wasn't one of the six and I go, oh, I totally had that figured out. <laughs> My favorite was when we, we, yeah, we walked into the back door of the, the clasp yeah. of the Thieves Guild, and he wasn't prepared for it. Um, man, that was a good game. <laughs> that was great. We just we were like, yeah, let's do this now. And I, like, I'll still never forget your face when you're like, oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we got like three, four uh, sessions before they actually meet up with the class and they're stuck to, where are you going? You're walking in the back door. All right. <laughs> you're basically ahead. like, hey, hey, what's up, class? Um, yeah, we kind of went in the back door and yeah. <laughs> And Matt rolls out one of the, the like dry erasable marker grids and starts just drawing the class. This is where the class lives. We're going off grid, folks. We're off grid. <laughs> Here we go. Good times. So yeah, it's gonna I go. I imagine weird. it's kind of like when you start an RPG and there's like the fog of war on the map and you kind of slowly you know, flesh out the map as you explore and then you just kind of lose some of that fog. I think he builds in the same way. Yeah. I can't say. I'm not, I'm not speaking for him. Yeah. But if, if, and if you want to say, just make up names of places. Be like, what's the name of an elven city? Zolvan. Right? Like... <laughs> Pervon? That's a real name! <laughs> the elven city of Pervon. Uh, <laughs> And someone says, like, well, you know, well, where are you from, sir? And like, well, I hail from the eleven city of Pervon. He just made up a name. But now, down the road, you can then begin developing this elven city of Pervon. Uh, Pervon. You know, and it, and it sounds like it sounds like you've had it planned this whole time because the name was mentioned so many sessions ago. It only really clarified like a week ago. But they don't do that. Magic. <laughs> Next question. Good question. Oh my. Oh! All right, we gotta start moving. You pick one. We're, we're, we're gonna try hey, to do be we able have to a panel it. in after us? Oh, yes. Yes. You got an 18. All right, <laughs> keep going. Oh, we have an 18. Uh, we got 15 us? minutes. So, okay, uh, go, go. We're gonna start trying to make this a little fast. We get through a lot of questions. Uh, uh, you use the uh, red and the gray. Yes, you. Okay. <laughs> well, well, just for those of us who are running Curse of Strahd, do you have any? Insight into Strahd from Zolich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for those who are running Curse of Strahd. Just, just not spoilers, because I don't yes. know if you've read the scenario, but mm. insight into the character. I, I haven't run the new scenario, of course, I've been running my own, but I've, I've played through two different Expedition to Ravenloft campaigns, and I played through one and DM'd one. Strahd's one of my favorite villains, and probably one of the better villains of the, all the D&D campaigns for a reason, because he's a complicated villain. He has a lot of a lot of very interesting things going on internally, and not all encounters are about seeing Strahd fighting Strahd. He's, he likes to talk, he likes to learn, he likes to take beads on players. If you're running a game for players, Strahd is powerful, and, and yeah, if you showed up and started fighting the, you know, the characters the second session in, he would wipe the floor with them. But sometimes Strahd just wants to talk and find out about them, ask them questions, maybe see elements of their history that, nobody should know and start messing with their head. Barovia is a strange place like that. Secrets are traded around, and God knows what the Vistani I managed to hear in the whispers while you're sleeping and don't realize you're talking in your sleep. You know, there, it, it's, it's such a great place, Barovia, for a dungeon master. Very scary place for a player. Um, it's hard to say anything about spoiling the character because there's a lot of intricacy to his backstory and a lot of, you know, his, his origin story, uh, his previous love, his, his brother, like there's so many aspects of it. But Strahd, I will say Strahd is more than the surface Dracula vampire you think he may be. There's a lot going on there. For good or bad, there's a lot going on. Next question. Uh, let's do in the back, uh, yeah, you, who's going like this. Yes, you. Sometimes it helps to flail. Um, yeah, so, uh, 
I watched your mm-hmm. role and stuff and all that, and I was just wondering. Dope. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, um, like, as a DM and an aspiring possible voice actor, as I want to try to do that in the future, uh, what are like some tips you could possibly give DMs as well as um, uh, actors? Uh, let's see. One. Wow, that's deep. Yeah. That's a I'll big question. Try and make this as, as concise as possible. Um, improv classes, once again, huge benefit, both as a player and as, I mean, look at Sam. Sam Sam was in UCB for a long time, and it shows. He's so fast, even when he has no idea what the hell's going on. <laughs> so it helps both sides, the player and as a DM. It's great. Um, but when you have free time on the freeway, driving in traffic, practice voices. Improvise dialogue to yourself. I'm that crazy guy on the road that's talking to himself, and everyone's like, "What the hell is that guy doing over there?" You know. And if you like, if you kind of start coming up with a voice that you've never done before, pull out your phone real fast and record 30 seconds of you just talking in it, because now you have something to go back to to remind yourself of that. And you can assign that to an NPC. Every NPC that I create, for the most part, I have in parentheses at the end of their brief description, like a texture, a pitch, and sometimes a dialect. So I'll, I'll go to someone and be like, you know. Uh, Relatively thick cockney, kind of gritty, low pitch. Or be like, you know, high and reedy voice, uh, more of a, a, a thick Scottish, uh, slightly abrasive, you know. And, and those are quick notes for you to go back to, but you find those voices by just practicing in the shower when you have time to yourself. Uh, you stopped and looked at me very expectantly. But yes, I'm ready. I've got something. Sorry, I'm I thought, good. I thought you were ready. No, I am. Um, uh, the illusion, see? Yeah, see? I'm so ready. I'm on top of it. I've slept today. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, a lot of people ask us, um, do you have to be like, we're, we're not voice actors and you guys do all these voices and I want to be a good DM like you, but I'm not like a voice actor. And, and you know, we tell, you don't have to be, you don't have to have this insane, you know, Mel Blanc type of range to be a DM. Um, just even it changing your, the placement of where the sound comes out in your mouth can be enough of an identifier. So, you know, for example, I'm, I naturally speak in the back of my throat which is why I've got this like gravelly thing, which like my theater teachers hated, but they love it in voiceover. But if you start moving it more to the front of your mouth and you start dropping a little bit more breathy, I didn't change my tonality at all. And this is more where Keelan lives. You know, it's a little gentler, it's a little softer. And you don't have to necessarily change. I didn't have to go into like a crazy voice to do anything crazy. You know, it's a little bit of placement. Um, it, and that can just make the world a difference. You talk all the time about uh, voicing women when you DM, and you don't, you know, you don't have to sound like an SNL character. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Which oh, we've all done as DMs. Yeah. Any any guy who's ever DM has gone Monty Python on this. Yeah. Don't deny it. <laughs> right. But 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 it, sometimes it's just changed in physicality too. You know, you're you're. I could be talking to you like this. Or I could be talking to you like this, and it not a change in voice, but this is an entirely different type of, you know, physicality to a character. You know, if I'm talking with the same voice like this, but I'm standing up a little bit with the shoulders to the front and looking down at you, it's an entirely different character. No change in voice, but the physicality can, can impart a, a, an entirely different delivery experience of that dialogue. And engagement is the key. Even if your voice doesn't change, engaging your players, making eye contact. And I know it's hard to, like, if you have notes down there back and forth, but uh, don't be afraid that when you finish your notes or when, you have, when you're feeling comfortable in those little NPC diatribes to then engage once more. Because it's that contact that one, helps facilitate the players to be more into role playing in the moment. It's interesting saying like the, shop, the shopkeeper offers you a better deal than going, I offer you a better deal. You know, one's a little more engaging. It's the same circumstance, but it just, it puts the player in the moment where they're having to connect with you and that gives them permission to then offer that same energy backward. And not everyone's gonna be comfortable with being that heavy into the role playing. Like some folks, it takes a while to come out of their shell and that's totally fine. You know, don't, don't ever feel too frustrated or, or exhibit that frustration on the player. Encourage them to be more comfortable. And if they aren't, then that's totally fine. But you know, present that opportunity for them to, to get out of their comfort zone and maybe discover something about themselves they didn't know they had, kind of like I did. So anyway, I hope that was a roundabout answer. <laughs> Right. Uh, oh, I picked him, so you pick. Okay, okay. We're trying to go through these pretty quick and rapidly so we can get some questions here. Uh, you have a very nice 
jacket and uh, collar. I have to call on you there. Oh, oh, you got like a cap thing going on. It's like so. What? 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 Is there a is there a presentation? I feel a presentation coming. Is oh this no, a... this this is from oh. Oh. <laughs> Yep. No, I McCready wore that for a while. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Great. Okay, go well, for it. Question. Um, oh, we got Preston Yeah. Yeah. And we got yes. a lot of settlement too. Oh, another man. Another settlement needs our help. <laughs> Don't you dare send me to another settlement that needs help, by the way, guys. I've helped like 60 of them, and none of them can take care of themselves. I was just there. Damn it. What do you mean they're going to get attacked by bandits? I just killed the ghouls. Yeah. Huh. Sorry, question? Um, I just had a bit of a curiosity as um, I never been one from DMing, it's never been my style, but I get, I get really into characters, like, a lot. I build characters in my free time, just like, oh, I've mm -hmm. uh, reused that thunder. Totally. Um, I, as a DM, that's all I can do. I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to know, as voice actors, have you ever walked into the booth, read the script, and realized that you already made the character you're voicing, that it's been like so drastically similar <laughs> that you're like, holy shit, make sure you're gonna tell me his mom was, oh my god, his mom is decent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Do you, do you have a story for it? Yeah, uh, you do. I, 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 I have a few. Uh, well, I will say that the, a lot of the characters that I auditioned with and a lot of characters that I played in video games started as NPCs in my old campaigns. I mean, both, both Adair and Aloth and Pillars of Eternity uh, were characters in an old campaign I ran out of high school. Uh, you know, like, the, the, so a lot of character voices and personalities, for me at least, I transcended from the game and then brought into my toolbox as a performer. Um, as far as finding similarities in them, well, the fantasy genre especially has its own tropes. Like, oh my god, his parents were also killed when he was young and he's an orphan wandering the land with power? <laughs> wandering swordsman in search of a purpose. That sounds just like... Every okay. high school D and D character ever. <laughs> so yeah, I've definitely had some similarities in those regards. Well, there's uh, even the uh, <laughs> the episode uh, not too long ago, so this shouldn't be huge spoilers. Where um, Grog fought Earthbreaker Groon, and he called upon Scanlan and and Vax, and he was just like, "Where do you get your power from?" My friends. And everyone was like, this is the anime episode. <laughs> like, it's so true. It's so true. It's so trophy. It's so you can't you just can't help it. But some tropes come from honesty. It's the power of friendship. <laughs> Craven Edge says otherwise. Well uh, good question. Yes. Alright, we got uh you have a question or are we running out of time? Ah, oh, that is a very good question. That is a good question. I will look this up with the 1% on my phone so it doesn't uh... Okay, so, uh, so tomorrow on Saturday we have autographs at 12.30 to 1.30, so you should bring your stuff to get signed. We'll go ahead and put our signatures on it. We even have posters to sell with artwork from Kid Boss, from Critical Role. That's like Keith, that's an Earth Elemental, Jeffy's on the Kavar and shit. It's really cool, you should have one. Uh, then on Sunday, we have our autograph session from 1.30 to 2 o'clock, so if you don't come tomorrow and you're running out of time, come on Sunday. Thank you, Strong Bad. Questions answered. <laughs> yeah. Then I don't know what your times are. <laughs> oh, 11? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently I'm signing at 11. Marisha signing at 11. <laughs> I just go where they tell me to go. I don't. <laughs> Look at on your schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, yeah, you do a ninjutsu. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. They're Rick and Morty. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. All right. <laughs> yeah, drink and free stuff, bro. Salt. Man, you are prepared for this panel. This, this is a week old. It's still healing. By the way. <laughs> no, oh, that looks wow, awesome. Oh, that's crazy. So, okay. I knew I was gonna come meet you before this got exhausted. Oh, 
Um, but I got a little bit more of a, uh, a crunch DM mechanics question. Oh yeah. I've been DMing Pathfinder for a few months shy of a year now, mm. and as far as difficulty in combat is concerned, I'm starting to find myself leaning on certain things that are maybe a little less fun for my players, like I've been dealing with the um, the tanky Ori cleric with probably a little bit more grappling than they'd like me to. <laughs> I've been leaning back on reach weapons an annoying amount. So what do you do to bring a fair challenge without recycling reach weapons, grappling, cheap magic spells off a spontaneous caster? How do you keep it interesting without getting cheap on your players? Good question. Yeah. I mean, cheap works on occasion. Um, but also consider not all challenges are based just straight on damage mechanics and weapon use. Uh, building interesting and dangerous terrain for a battle can make what seems like a relatively pushover combat into a very, very precarious situation for the party. If you have an entire group of individuals that are across a giant chasm with ranged heavy crossbows and the party can't find a way to get across because there's perpetual wind blowing up heavy across the way, but their you know their bolts are enchanted to be uh, you know resistant to the wind as they're native to this terrain. That, that's a way where the party's like, oh crap, we're just being pegged at from a distance. Or consider uh, fighting in a place that itself is very fragile and the, the terrain itself is collapsing during the battle and elements that begin to fall away. Kind of you know we're talking top of ice crown style battle with you know Arthas. Uh, you know who you are. You got that reference. <laughs> Because we all suffered in torment trying to finish that fight. Um, but, you know, oh yeah, you understand. Um, or consider there can be elements to the battle where the enemy might be resistant to most damage until you discover an aspect hidden within there. Almost like, not quite like a Lich's Flactor, but something that that character is bound to that is hidden within that battlefield. And so it's half a battle and half trying to search and scour the scenery for a means of disabling their defenses. Or consider, um, uh, a, a battle where there is a large amount of innocents that are locked away, and the longer the battle goes, collateral damage and innocents are being killed until the party can try and spend more time defending them versus just keeping the damage onto the enemy. Who are you? <laughs> I'm coming up with different ways to make challenge! Or it can be uh, you know, enemies that, that, as opposed to just dealing damage, it's a very, very high piece of terrain, and they are more about grabbing and chucking things off of cliff sides. Or... Uh, or elemental aspects, a lightning storm, where you randomly start just striking down the areas of the battlefield, enemy, or, or friend. I don't know. No, keep going. I'm taking notes. <laughs> mental notes. You know, these are all just random, random things that could add difficulty or challenge to a battle without it just being a direct, uh, my guys have longer weapons than yours. Um, Mind you, which has its place. But yeah, if you're finding yourself recycling those tropes too often, then think of other things outside of just damage. And if a creature you want them to fight doesn't quite have an interesting toolbox, you can create abilities that they have beyond what the, what the book tells you. Perhaps this one brand of, of giant scorpion lived too close to a cluster of long buried, you know, pure arcane energy and that's such the beginning to mutate these crystals. And whenever anybody attacks them with a physical attack, it creates a, you know, a, a, a feedback shockwave of arcane energy that does additional damage. You know, you can think of things that you can attach to existing creatures to make them different. I'm getting the wrap-up sign, which means I'm, I failed at answering questions rapidly. But I think that's the nature of the panel. Um, One more quick question. Very quick question, then we're guess. out of here. Oh, boy. Oh, uh, you look so eager back there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yes. First time DM tips? Uh, nervous is part of it. Uh, <laughs> harness the nervous energy. Um, you know, th that's what'll propel you when you ha when you're in that that seat of, of not knowing what's happening. So don't. It's okay. To understand that it's okay to be nervous and be afraid of what's happening. Um, Use the adrenaline rush. Yeah. To, to try the to make adrenaline is real. Because we got to run out of here. Uh, the biggest advice I would give uh, for this circumstance is one, have a chance to chat with the players enough. If, if, if they're people you don't know very well originally, meet with them each individually beforehand for lunch and get to know them as a person beforehand so you kind of know what you're getting into before you start the game. Uh, also asking them what they want out of the game so you can tailor a story that hopefully they'll all be happy with and get what they want out of the experience. 
And uh, kind of similar to what I said before, prepare best you can, but don't over-prepare, because if, if you over-prepare one or two major paths and they end up completely veering off to the side, you will spend all those hours on something that no one will ever see and have no idea what's going on. Or conversely, try and find ways where you can redirect the story back towards what you had prepared. Um, so I would recommend, as opposed to really fleshing out one path, loosely flesh out multiple paths and give that opportunity where you feel like you have kind of a handhold on what's happening, uh, but not fully, as opposed to having a really good grasp on one path, and if it goes any other way, you're screwed. Hope that's helpful. Let's do one more quick question. It's, it's a good time. closer. Good okay. closer. All right. uh, let's do, uh, yeah, front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mr. Mercer, yes. what is your favorite part of DMing in Mr. Marisha? What is your favorite part of playing with Mr. Mercer? You first. My favorite part of playing Dungeons & Dragons, just in general, as a part of any game, is the ability to have dreams later on in that world and be like, oh shit, my brain just thinks that all actually happened and I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> I'm kind of okay with looking back and the memories of me having in you know that that Orlando trip in sixth grade and the memories that I have of fighting a beholder are pretty much the exact same in my head so don't. My favorite part of being a GM or a DM is every time you describe to a player uh, the reaction to an action they took uh, that they're that they were trying for in a success or a massive failure, but 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 some sort of, of reaction to an action that they attempted, and watching them light up and smile as they suddenly realize that they've driven a part of the story forward, and they realize that they have as much agency and the ability to create in the space as you do, and that to me is above and beyond the gift of being a DM is watching other people create in the world that you created. Thank you. Good final question. Yeah, good. Thank you guys so much. So I know many of you didn't get your questions answered. Thank you. Uh, if you still have questions, we have other panels throughout the weekend. You can search this, the schedule. They're mostly voiceover related, but if you squeeze in a role-playing game question here and there, you won't argue. I have a stunt acting and like stunt fighting for the the camera panel tomorrow at like eight from like eight thirty to nine thirty or nine thirty to ten thirty, something like that. But yeah, it's yeah. it's fun, and you bring like sweatpants and get active because I teach you how to punch. <laughs> Don't punch each other though. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, Wonderful the questions. One, the morning one at like nine yeah. got canceled because yeah. you guys aren't going to be up. Don't lie. I'm not going to be either. So it, it's the later one. Do the later one, not the 9 a.m. one. I won't yeah. be there. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you tomorrow.